to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. We're so glad that you joined us for our study today. This, of all questions that have ever been asked, this is the single most important question. And friend, we're asking you today, have you done what the Bible says you must do to be saved? We hope you've got your Bible, that you'll have it out and ready as we're going to let God's Word in our study today answer this question. And all we ask of you is that you let the Word of God be your guide. You examine your life and salvation based on it. And so thank you for joining us in this study today. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. What does the Bible teach a person must do to be saved? My friend, that question is asked in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. It's a very interesting scene. The, the walls of the jail begin to shake. The, the prison doors flew open. At that very moment, a prison guard awoke. He realized his own fate, and he started to commit suicide. But before he did, he heard these encouraging words. Sir, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And upon the heels of that encouraging statement, the single greatest question that's ever been asked comes. Sirs, what must I do? to be saved. Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. As near as I can tell, this question is asked two other times in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, when they realized they had killed their own Messiah, they were cut to the heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Acts chapter 9, verse 6, when Saul is confronted with the truth, he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Friend, that's what we're asking you today. Have you done what God says you must do to be saved? You know, this question, what must I do to be saved? I think if we took just a moment to examine that question, it might help us to understand the importance of that. For example, we could ask the question like, what 
must I do to be saved? Do we realize that salvation's active? It doesn't happen by the process of osmosis. You've got to actually do something. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father. We could then ask the question like this, what must I do to be saved? Salvation is not only active, salvation is imperative. This is a question that you cannot afford to answer wrong. Acts 9, verse 6, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. It is an imperative. It is a must that we answer this question correctly. Our eternal destiny weighs in the balance. But you know, we can also ask the question like this. What must I do to be saved? Not only is salvation active and salvation imperative, but this question is of a personal nature. We're not asking today what must somebody else do? What did your kin folks do? What did somebody somewhere tell you to do? We're asking, what must I, according to Jesus and the Bible, do to be saved? And here's why that's so important. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. I'm not going to be judged by other people, for other people, based on what they did or did not do. I'm going to be judged personally based on what I did. And then we could ask it this way. What must I do to be saved? Friend, this is eternal in importance. If you answer this question, if we answer this question correctly according to the Bible, Jesus promises us a place in that beautiful mansion with him. John 14, verses 1 through 6. If we answer it incorrectly, friend, there is a place called hell. And those who don't obey the gospel, sadly, will go there. And so this, this, this lesson is going to answer two basic questions. What do I need to know to be saved? And what must I do to be saved? But before we go there, friend, I'd like to ask you to do something personal with me. First, I want you to know that our motive, everything we're saying, everything about this is because we love you and we want you to go to heaven. God loves you immensely. So much he gave his son to die for you. John 3, 16. The only thing we want for you is for you to obey the gospel, to go to heaven, and to live in that place with God. That's our only motive. Now there's a second thing we want to ask you to do today. I want you to pause for just a moment. And I want you in your own mind to make your salvation experience crystal clear. Do you remember where you were at when you were saved? Do you remember how old you were? Do you remember what happened? Do you remember what steps? Maybe you were at camp. Maybe you were in front of a TV. Maybe you were in a church building. Up Do you remember what steps you took? Maybe somebody told you to believe on Jesus and you'd be saved. Maybe somebody told you to say the sinner's prayer and you'd be saved. All I'm asking right now is, just make it crystal clear in your mind about your own salvation experience. This is where I was at. This is how old I was. This is what I did when I was saved. My friend, here's all we're asking of you today. I want you to hold that up. Let's examine what Jesus teaches in the New Testament and see if the two match. If they match, my friend, that's wonderful news. If they don't, we encourage you to obey what Jesus tells you to do to be saved. And so what does a person need to know, first of all, to be saved? Friend, it's evident that you've got to know certain things to be saved. For Jesus said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. To be saved, what do I have to know? Well, first of all, I've got to know that I'm lost in sin or I've got no desire to be saved, right? And the Bible teaches that all of an accountable age have sinned and are lost. There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, verse 10. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who sins, who does good, and does not sin. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. And our sins separate us from a loving 
and holy God. And so first and foremost, you've got to know, outside of Jesus, I am lost in sin. Secondly, you've got to know that you cannot save yourself. In the long ago, in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, Jeremiah said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. I've got to realize Jesus has the words of eternal life. John 6, verse 68, Trust, lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct your paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. I've got to realize there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death, and salvation is in Christ. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10. I've got to know, outside of Jesus, I'm lost in sin. This is a problem and a predicament that I can't solve by myself. No man, no man or men anywhere can solve for me. I've got to realize, thirdly, only God can save me. It is by the grace of God that we'll be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace are you saved. It is by the, the mercy of God that we're going to be saved. Titus 3 verse 5, we're saved in his mercy. It is by the good news of Jesus Christ that I'm saved. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. Romans 1 verse 16, it is by obedience to the will of God. Matthew 7 verse 21. And friend, if a person's going to be saved, he's got to do what Jesus says. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord's going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so once I realize that I am lost in sin, that I can't save myself, and that only God, his grace, his mercy, his gospel, his will, and in his church can I be saved? Friend, I've got to ask the next question, that powerful question of Acts 16, 30, and 31. God, what must I do to be saved? And I'm thankful that question is asked and answered with great clarity in the Bible. And so let's take a moment to consider for ourselves, what does the Bible teach? I'm not asking you today, what have you heard? I'm not asking what has the pastor said. I'm not asking what some religious leader somewhere said or what your grandparents did or didn't do. We're asking today, what does God in the Bible say I've got to do to be saved? And really, that's all that matters because I'm going to be judged by the words of the Bible, John 12, 48, and it's the gospel that saves us. So let, let's ask and answer that question. What must a person do to be saved? The Bible teaches first that you have to hear the Word of God. Would you open your Bible with me to Romans chapter 10? I want you to see it for yourself in your own copy of the Bible. Look in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. To be saved, one has to hear the message of the gospel. The Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, how do we know here that hearing the Word of God is essential? Because faith is essential, right? Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Is it absolutely essential that I have faith in God to be saved? No doubt about it. Without faith, you can't please God. It's impossible. Hebrews eleven six. 6. If that's true, whatever way you get faith is also essential, right? Look at Romans 10, 17 again. How do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If I'm going to be saved, I must listen to and hear the word of God. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Psalm 95 verse 7. My friend, I want to ask you today, what does it mean to hear the word of God? Does it mean just whatever anybody says that they claim is from the Bible, you automatically accept and do that hook, line, and sinker? Now, hearing the Word of God means this. It means that I recognize the authority. It's all about authority. It means that I recognize the authority of God's Word. Let me illustrate. Mark chapter 9. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him up on that high mountain. 
He is there transfigured before him. The disciples become scared. They don't know what to do. So Peter blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. One account tells us before he even got those words out of his mouth fully, a voice came down from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen now, hear ye him. Hearing the word of God means I recognize the authority of Jesus and his new law. All authority, Jesus said, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The Bible teaches that he's going to be the judge in the final day, John 12, verse 48, and that we must submit to him. But you know, hearing the word of God also means that I check everything I'm told to make sure it's correct. Friend, we are not asking you. Please understand. We are not asking you to point blank without any checking except what we're saying today. That is the furthest from the truth. In fact, true hearing of the gospel means that you check it by the book. Let me give you an example. Acts 17, 11. The Bible says that the Bereans, these are more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Let me show you what happened. The apostle Paul comes into the region of Berea, goes up to a home in a neighborhood, knocks on the door. People there open the door. Paul tells who he is. I'm, I'm Paul, I've converted to Christianity. We, we, I wanna tell you about Jesus. Paul, we've heard about you. They didn't slam the door in his face. They said, okay, come on in, tell us about it. We've heard some things, we'd like to know the truth. So Paul comes in. He gives a spiel about Jesus. He shows from the Old Testament all the prophecies and passages, and, and they're listening attentively, and they're taking notes. And when Paul gets to the end, what they do? Did they automatically, okay, you're Paul, it must be true, we believe it. They said, Paul, we want to thank you for coming by today. What you've said has been wonderful. We've taken notes. Now we're going to check it. They search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. True hearing of the gospel means we recognize the authority of Jesus and his word, and we check everything by the book. If it's not in the book, I don't want it. If it's in the book, I better do it. That's what God teaches in his word. And so first and foremost, I must hear the gospel. Secondly, I must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Friend, listen carefully to me. There is absolutely no way a person can be saved unless he believes in Jesus. Listen to the importance of it. John 8, 24, Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, the, the Savior of the world, the great I am, the Son of God, God in the flesh, unless you believe that I am he, you will surely die in your sins. It was a hindrance in Acts chapter 8. Do you remember it? Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are traveling in the chariot. In the distance, he sees water. Hey, here's water. What hinders me? Ah, here's the hindrance first. If you believe with all your heart, you may. There was something he had to do first. And he had to believe Jesus was the Son of God before he could have his sins washed away. And so absolutely, one must believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're not even a candidate to be saved. But friend, hear me well. Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that belief alone saves. There is a false doctrine that is promoted by many that says all you've got to do is have belief and faith alone to be saved. Friend, this is what we're talking about listening to the Word of God, okay? Did you know in my Bible and in yours the words faith alone occur one time and God says the exact opposite of what people are teaching concerning faith only? Let me show you in the Bible. Open to James chapter 2. The only time the words faith only occur in the Bible, they teach us that faith alone will not save. Look in verse number 24. The Bible says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. We're not talking about meritorious works. In the context, that's not what is being spoken of. We're not talking about, I've said enough Hail Marys. I've done enough good. That's not the idea. Not something by which you can merit or earn it. But there are definitely conditional works one must meet. Belief is a conditional work. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he sent. John chapter 6, verse 29. 
And so there are conditions a person has to meet. But listen now, the only time in the Bible faith only occurs. We are not saved by faith alone. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. You're not justified by faith alone. The Bible clearly teaches that idea. And while we're on that topic, Here's another thing that people are trying to trick you about when it comes to salvation. I hear it pretty regular. I've heard it by a multitude of denominational preachers. They will say to you, if you want to be saved, you need to say the sinner's prayer. And here's how that prayer goes. Lord Jesus, I accept you as Lord and Savior. I ask you now to come into my heart and save me. Now, here's what's amazing about that. You can search your Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 until your eyes bug out. And you won't find the sinner's prayer one time in the whole Bible for salvation. It's just not in there. It's made up by men. Does a person have to hear the word of God? Absolutely. Do you have to believe in Jesus? No doubt about it. Thirdly, a person must repent of sins. I want you to take your Bible and look with me. And I want you to see that Jesus teaches one must repent or turn from sin. Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. To be saved, must I repent? Repent and be baptized. Repent and turn again. Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19, Luke 13 verse 3. We're not talking about, okay, I just feel sorry for sin. Godly sorrow produces repentance, but we're talking about a changed life. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, Luke chapter 3, verse 8. And so the hard part, the really hard part, is turning from that life of sin to change your way of thinking and change your way of acting. And that's a process. We're not, am I saying I'm perfect on that? Or you're, no, I made up my mind to repent. That's what we're saying. And that's a process that we try to do each and every day of our lives. Well, what else must a person do to be saved? The Bible teaches. You must confess Jesus as Savior. Listen to Romans 10, verse 10. With the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Now we mentioned that hindrance in Acts chapter 8. Hey, here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. You know what the Ethiopian eunuch said? He made that good confession. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And then, my friend, the Bible teaches, not me, not you, not somebody else, in your Bible and mine, it teaches to be saved, a person must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of his sins. Please understand, in the Bible, baptism is immersion not sprinkling and not pouring. John 3, verse 23, the Bible says John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. Why much water? Baptism is a burial. When you've gone to a graveside and you saw somebody buried, did they dump a shovel full of dirt on them? No, completely engulfed. Jesus at his baptism went down into the water and he came up out of that. That's the picture. Acts chapter 8, they both got down to the chariot. When he baptized them, they came up out of the water. And so every time you see baptism in the Bible, it's always by immersion. But friend, listen carefully today to what the Bible says about baptism. The Bible teaches baptism is something you must do to be saved. Listen carefully to me now. I did not say, the Bible does not say because you are saved. The Bible does not say it is an outward expression of you've already been saved. The Bible says baptism is something you do to be saved, prior to being saved. Listen to Mark 16, verse 16. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. If you don't believe, you're not a candidate. But if you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. Acts 2.38, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Baptism is to be saved, is for the remission of sins. Baptism is to have your sins washed away. Paul was told, arise and be baptized 
wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Did you know that the only time in the Bible it says you contact the death of Jesus is when you're buried with him in water? Does the death of Jesus save? Does his sacrifice save? Does his blood save? Absolutely. When do I contact that? We're baptized with Christ into his death. We're buried with him in that watery grave. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And friend, realize this. Probably the clearest verse of all. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Peter said, There's a like figure which doth also now save us. Baptism. Or as the King James says, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if God wanted to make it any clearer that you had to be baptized to be saved, that it's where you contact the blood and the death of Jesus, how could he make it any clearer in 1 Peter 3.21? Baptism does now also save us. That clearly teaches I've got to be baptized to be saved. Did you know that's through baptism, that culminating act in the plan of salvation, that through baptism is how I get into Christ? You see, all spiritual gifts are in Christ, right? Ephesians 1 verse 3. The Bible teaches salvation is in Christ, right? 2 Timothy 2 verse 10. And so imagine this represents being in Christ. In Christ are all spiritual blessings and salvation. Now I'm out here and I want to get in Christ. How do I do that? Listen to Galatians 3 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. The Bible teaches that to get from here into Christ, we're baptized into Christ. That's what God's Word says. That's what the Bible teaches. We're not asking you to believe us or anybody else. And so we ask you today, remember at the outset, we said, make your salvation experience clear. Let's examine what the Bible says. Do the two match up? Friend, if they don't, we want you to know God loves you. We love you. If you need to make changes, please do that. Your soul depends on it. We love you. Join us next time as we study more about the gospel. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs, today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.